Well, welcome everyone. We are at 11 o'clock, so I think we'll go ahead and um, get the session started today. A couple of kind of housekeeping notes before we jump into today's session. Um, first of all, there is a chat window on the um, right-hand corner of the screen there that you can maximize. Um, you're certainly welcome to send in um, questions via chat, either directly to uh, myself um, or to the group um, at large, and then we'll get those asked to the presenter. Um, also, um, you do have the ability to unmute yourself and we'll have a couple different pauses during the presentation where we'll invite you if you'd like to unmute and ask questions um, to do that. And then also at the end of today's session, we'll certainly open it up again if you'd like to unmute yourself um, and ask any questions. Put your mouse in the upper right hand corner of the screen. You have some options on the layout in terms of how you see the presenter versus the slides. Um, and that is just adjusting your own screen viewing. So feel free to set that however you like. You're not changing it for um, everyone watching today, so you can switch back and forth there um, as well. And then a couple announcements just about the entire 2021 um, webinar series. Um, we have set the dates of the first Thursday of each month at 11 o'clock. In the next week or two, we'll probably post the entire um, schedule out to our website so you can plan and uh, pick those topics that you think are going to be of interest to you and mark your calendar in advance for those um, as well. So watch the website in the next week or two for those. Um, but just a reminder for February, we do have that one um, set in stone and the title is finalized and that information is actually on the website as well. So February 4th, um, Adrian Good, who is the Ponderay County um, Extension Agent, um, one of my team members um, will be talking about using social media to reach your clientele. And specifically, she's gonna talk a little bit about TikTok. Um, so I'll be interested to hear it because that is certainly not my expertise area. So always nice to have folks uh, that know something that I don't. So with that, um, let me introduce um, today's presenter and then I'll turn it over here to Christine. So Christine Liddick is um, based out of Missoula, Montana, and she's going to come to us um, with a couple different bits of expertise today. She's certainly serving as a business advisor currently in her role um, there at... Um, in Missoula, but she was a business owner two different times and had two um, very successful businesses in the past. So I think she's mm -hmm. going to tap into a lot of the lessons she learned and the knowledge she gained um, from those experiences um, to talk a little bit about how you can steer your business through change, which seems to be the um, word of the year or maybe two years here. Um, so with that, Christine, I will turn it over to you. Well, hey, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, if you can't hear me, or if, as Joel said, you have a question, I am going to take a couple breaks um, as I go through my presentation today. And I just want to say thanks for this opportunity. Um, I do feel like I'm going to use this opportunity to share stories, um, to try and direct the messaging, or at least the learned perspective that I have um, from operating businesses for 25 years. Um, when I think about presenting today, I, I'm not going to lie, um, after everything that happened yesterday, I'm just a little exhausted with change. I'm a little exhausted at trying to think about what it looks like to have an operational mindset that stays positive and hopeful and shift with change. But the, the reality is, in business, we're dealing with change every day. And we just don't register it. Um, it becomes habit forming and we just move through it. But it's those larger pieces and elements of change um, that tend to stop us in our tracks or make us feel disabled or debilitated. Um, and so I'm going to share a few stories. I think uh, it's important to note that when I was in business, I would not have shared these stories of these changes and what I was dealing with, with the the populace around me, and there's a, a fear always that when we share our stories or if our business is struggling, somehow we're not doing well. Um, in hindsight, I think these stories have a lot to offer on how to shift through change and to look at maybe a new operational mindset. So I'm going to share my screen here real quickly and get going. I'm going to share three different stories today. Oh, I am sharing. You can see it already. Yep, oh, good. You were about to say that, Joel. I appreciate that. So I'll start out with um, Bernice's recipe. And when we first bought Bernice's, I purchased it with my husband. And we decided to sit down and 
create something even simpler than a mission statement. And that was a recipe uh, for our business. And we looked at our business in its simplest terms and discovered that what we believed in and what we wanted to be our driving decision maker was to always come back to the fact that our recipe was flour, eggs, butter, sugar, people, and community. And every time we were looking at, let me see, what the pie chart of our business looked like, those were the elements and the ingredients that we looked at when making decisions and when contemplating or having to respond to change. We bought the bakery in 2004 and promptly in 2007 slash 2008, the price of flour went up 300%. Bakeries across America closed overnight, locked their doors, 11% of bakeries across America. For us as new business owners in 2004, we just did not have that option. And right away, just as we were starting to feel a little bit of smooth flow in year three slash four of ownership, we were tossed up in the air, realizing we had some change that we had to address. And what we did and how we thought about it is we went back to that original recipe I showed you, but began realizing, hey, we have this big, huge inventory of baking product that we're dealing with. And we know it's fun. I mean, I've got this 64 box of crayons and, and I have this here because we started thinking of our inventory as a crayon box and our bakers were wonderful and talented people, but they had this plethora of inventory that they could use and work with and we needed to hone it down. And so the first step in responding to the price of flour increase was to look at our inventory and to lower it to 16 crayons. And that seems like a huge um, reduction, but really it was just our way of sharing with our team, hey, we're gonna reduce our inventory and you get 16 crayons now. And what we're gonna focus on is being more creative with less. Instead of having more is more, we focused on less is more and pushed our team and ourselves to be more creative with less. In the end, what that resulted in was us focusing on our highest margin product with less inventory. And so Bernice's made a drastic shift in what it was producing and where its attention was focused because we knew that with flour, butter, sugar, eggs, we could create cakes. And so we looked at lessening our inventory as what do we need? What do we use more frequently as a special ingredient? And we became known as the cake bakery in Missoula. So when we bought the bakery in 2004, we made eight cakes a day. By the time 2010, 2009, after the um, commodities market shift, we were making upwards of 30, 35 cakes a day. And now Bernice's makes anywhere from 50 to 60 cakes a day. But our response was to think of lowering our inventory, invest in our highest profit margin product. In addition to that, and in knowing that's where we were focusing, my husband and I looked at staff retention. We knew we were in the food service business and we knew that we needed to train high quality bakers to manage these very small number of ingredients in the best ways possible. And so at that moment, we started focusing even more on the people who were part of our business. Um, as I am sharing this with you, I want to just uh, come back and ask if anyone feels like they have an inventory of 64 crayons and a way in which there might be something that you're hanging on to that you could let go of during this time that might benefit your business. Anybody have any thoughts right out of the gate? And it's quiet. And again, feel free to unmute yourself. You should all have the ability to do that or type something in the chat window too, if you'd like. I see the chat has a little red dot on my end. I don't know if there's a question in there I can't see or if it was just someone saying good morning. 
You know, it was sent directly to you, so I can't see it. Oh, interesting. Okay. But if you lift up on that red arrow, it should show up for you. Well, it's big support from Jen, so I'm good. Okay. Well, I'll keep going then and talk about um, the second big change. And um, I need to share again, I believe. So give me just one second. All righty. 2009 and 2010 came right behind a time where we felt we knew exactly what our business needed to be. And of course, we were dealing with small change, but 2009, 2010, I'm sure for some of you sitting and listening today, you remember that time. And that was when we experienced um, a nationwide recession um, and directly connected to the, the housing bubble. But Immediately what happened in our business is people were not spending big dollars anymore. And we had just pivoted ourselves to creating a situation where we had our highest profit margin item was carrying our bakery by and large, and we needed to look at shifting again. As cake sales decreased, we once again went back to our 16 crayons and talked to our staff about the fact that we were going to narrow our inventory even further, taking a look at what now were the products that we were using less frequently since we had gone from 64 crayons to 16 crayons, and now we're going to narrow our inventory further. Our staff was absolutely starting to buy in at this time, starting to understand what it looks like to actually run a business to be asked to participate in decision-making and to move forward with us at this time when we were seeing our cakes sit on the shelf and not seeing them fly out of the bakery. What ended up happening was we started focusing and doing a flip-flop shift and moving towards smaller items that customers could buy that still made them feel like they were giving themselves a gift. And nationally, cupcakes were selling everywhere across the nation. We just hadn't done them. Bernice's barely had a cake program, if you remember, when my husband and I bought the bakery. So we took this moment and this crazy time of feeling financially unstable and feeling like we were dealing with another crisis to do an operational mind shift. We got our bakers to buy in. We created small, teeny little cakes, cupcakes, and focused on creating our sugar cookies, which there in that cute little picture, you see our general manager's son with a sugar cookie in front of his face. Um, we started to develop our sugar cookie. And then also you're seeing our breakfast items. All of those items you could get with a cup of coffee for $5. And so our community and customers that were coming in were starting to come in in quantity to make up for the fact that we were not selling our high-end cakes as often or as frequently as possible. In addition, we also began realizing as we looked back at our original recipe that while we were investing in our staff, we'd lost sight of the people investment where our community was concerned. We had felt at that time that we bought the bakery three years later, we had one crisis we were dealing with three years later, we had another crisis we were dealing with and we'd forgotten to look outside of our bubble. And so what we did was we became better community members. Again, we started participating in boards, we started participating in different networks that could support our business or at least connect us to our community members. We worked with our area of Missoula, which is called the hip strip and started to throw block parties and we engaged in customer service. And then, bam, no sooner had we started engaging in all these activities that were feeding this $5 increased um, flow of traffic and quantity, then we hit turnover. So we were aware, we were always aware, small change. It's the food service industry. We're gonna flip a customer, we're gonna flip our employees, that's part of what happens. But what happened in 2010 slash 2011 is we saw turnover and not this kind of turnover. We had just invested in all these people that you're staring at and had created artisans 
and makers and people who were entertaining and funny. If you see to the left, there's a, or probably your right, a black and white photo of myself and our general manager at the time. We were doing a black and white movie on YouTube, just playing and having fun with our community and had gotten our, st our staff to this place of buy-in and they were talented and ready to move on. They had grown past working at Bernice's while they were going to college and we saw mass turnover, close to 50% of our staff. That particular crisis for us was maybe one of the hardest for us to absorb because we had done all the right things. These people had stayed with us three and five years, but it was the same group of people and a larger chunk of our um, talented staff was departing. So we looked and did a huge operational mindset change and said, we need to develop a different managerial system for our 24 hour bakery. Marco and I could not handle on our own all of these individuals in the multiple different departments of the bakery. So we had had two managers at that time. We hired two more managers and put into play a leadership program. Our leadership program was about a third of our employees. So we had 35 employees. About a third of them would wrap around the table once a week. And in, they could be managers, but they were also individuals on the team that their coworkers had said, perhaps Bryce needs to come on and sit on the leadership team table. You need to hear what he has to say this week. We put that leadership table and program into play. And what happened after that time is we increased and our retention of staff from three to five years, from more to five to six years, even six to nine years if someone was in management. And right now I know at Bernice's, um, after selling the bakery, that right now they're even still hanging on to six of some of our original team members who were here in 2010, 2011. And in fact, right smack in the middle there is a gentleman uh, sifting some cocoa. His name's Joe Smith, and he is still working at the bakery now. Um, I will just say as a side note, if you're interested in what sort of an energy and investment in people look like, um, from this business standpoint, you can go on YouTube and watch this crazy little black and white video we made at this time or watch a few great bakeries um, and see how Bernice has put itself out there in the community and pushed and reinforced our foundational principles um, during yet another three-year chunk of crazy crisis time. And then, boom. Boom. And I am going to pause and remove the boom and just put my face up here. Boom is real. 2013, we had uh, purchased our building that Bernices was in. And that building had four apartments up above the bakery. And we had a tenant above the bakery attempt to shake and bake meth. And they exploded one of the apartments above the bakery and shifted the entire foundation of the building during the explosion five days before Valentine's Day. So we're a bakery. It's Valentine's Day. We sell thousands of sugar cookies, hundreds of cakes, all kinds of chocolate dipped X, Y, and Z, and our building had just exploded. It was a devastating moment and a huge dig deep down, find a way to figure out how to get through it. And what happened was magical. Everything that we had done from purchasing the bakery in 2004 and all of the shifts in our mindset and how we had honed and invested in our people started to shine like a golden star during this moment. We had press, we had detectives, we had customers on the phone wanting to find out about the explosion, customers wanting to order 100 more sugar cookies for their staff. We were inundated with activity and distraction. And all of a sudden, what my husband and I got to see was our team of people move in this incredibly beautiful, I don't know if any of you watch the Food Network ever, or when Gordon Ramsay goes into a restaurant and it looks totally chaotic, and then all of a sudden everything looks smooth, or a good or bad episode of Hell's Kitchen. We were magical. 
it was high stress. It was unbelievable crisis. And our team had so much buy-in and we had spent time and energy buying into our team and our community that the movement and the way we moved through the final crisis of our bakery ended up being something that we look back on and realize each one of the steps that we took in finding a way and finding strength and confidence to manage whatever that situational change was in front of us turned into a wonderful way to respond to a terrible crisis at the end of our tenure. And those are my stories today. And what am I hoping you'll take away? Well, you know, everybody takes away their own gold nugget. I think my takeaway is that I hope at this time, everybody realizes they're not alone. I hope at this time we acknowledge that we know that there's change um, and that we can find our ability to adapt and find confidence in kicking out a response to what's happening around us by looking at changing our operational mindset and remembering that we're surrounded by wonderful employees. If we're alone and we're a micro business, we're surrounded by networks and our customers and clients who want us to succeed. So I hope that's what you take away. And I hope that maybe you have questions and maybe it's about what I presented or maybe it could be about anything that has to do with owning Bernice's um, or also my previous business prior to Bernice's Redbird restaurant. So I'm here for any questions. Well, let me start you off with one and then we'll open the floor to anybody that wants to unmute or put one in the um, chat window as well. So you've made some of these changes to either re improve retention or cut the number of your ingredients to streamline things. Did you know along the way that those steps, I mean, looking back at it, you can say those are good steps while you were living through it. Did you, what kind of metrics were you looking at to know whether you were on the right track? Um, well, for each situation, the metrics were different, right? Um, the very first change, I would say, we didn't know if we were making the right change. Um, we felt like we were because we knew that we needed to lean into our highest profit margin item. We just didn't have a choice when we were looking at the dramatic increase of flour price um, and what that really was going to do for all of our product. And so part of what I didn't mention as well, and not to be assumptive, but just to give a 20 minute um, presentation is that we also had to winnow down what we were serving. So we did cut out a number of products that we were serving based on the data and the reports that we had of what was selling well, what wasn't selling well, looking at what ingredients were connected to that item in order to winnow down. And I think you're right. I think um, hindsight's 2020, And that's really why I ended talking about the explosion. Um, because when you get woken up out of bed at four in the morning with an explosion, you're you're not thinking about um, the fact that everything that you've done up until this point actually becomes a saving grace as you're trying to deal with insurance representatives and the press and motivating your team. And all of a sudden you're seeing all those elements start operating magically. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. I think I gave a data, but also just a reflective piece. All right. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to ask a question? Maybe to give people another minute to think to I'll catch up. When I started the introduction today, I didn't thank our sponsors for the series. So let me do that while people are thinking of questions. Um, today's series was, you know, a joint project here with um, small business development centers in Montana, the Montana Department of Commerce, um, Small Business Administration, Montana State University Extension, and the Montana Economic um, Developers Association, and then we get some special support from the University of Montana and um, Grow Great Falls Economic Development. So that should have been in my opening part, but I put it in here. So um, do we have any more questions? It's quiet today and I don't blame you. It's been a long 11 months and last night was exhausting. And for all of us that work with the SPDC and state, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, so I hope I gave you just a little bit of fresh air to breathe in and to shape shift and start your day off heading in the direction we're all headed. So, Christine, just over the last few months, we've obviously seen lots of changes businesses have dealt with. And you 
mentioned some big ones for your uh, businesses there. Um, have you seen businesses that have effectively responded to some of these changes to grow and shift the direction of their business? Um, or are you seeing others where maybe more business owners are struggling to find ways forward um, from the changes? I absolutely have seen both. And I think as I watch and work with businesses, it reminds me of most high stress moments or traumatic response where people are in fight or flight. And so we're seeing both of those responses, or I am seeing both of those responses right now. Um, I definitely am working with businesses um, who are sitting in that um, fight position and, and are holding off, not wanting to pivot or shift directionally how they're operating their business because they believe we're seeing a light at the end of the tunnel um, as vaccines are coming out or whatever the, the good message of the day is. And yet we know we're still on this elongated journey that's going to take quite a bit of time to come out to the other side. But the other business owners, entrepreneurs, I'm seeing so many people want to look at this time and see opportunity and open new businesses. But also I have watched and had interaction with business owners who it, it's like it, a fire was lit in them. And they're like, oh, this is my favorite part. This is what I loved about my business when I first made it. And I had to come up with new ideas. And I had to think about what's that new twist? What do people want? How can I be different? And so the businesses that are clicking in that way are really finding some stable ground and success at this time. All right. Thank you. And we did have a question come in the chat window here. Um, what do you see as the main upcoming challenge that businesses can expect and prepare for? Well, uh, I guess this is me being intuitive because I certainly don't have a crystal ball. Um, but my intuition would tell me it's twofold. Um, and in part, that's because I'm working with the Missoula County Health Department weekly and the messages still from the health department that we're, it's going to get a little worse before it gets better. That everything that we've done up until this point in responding to the virus specifically um, is like practice and that it's going to get a little bit worse before it gets better. Um, as far as in the business community, I think I think people can expect and should prepare for continuing to run tightly, continuing to be mindful, and to really acknowledging that we're not sure where the next layer of help or assistance is going to come from. And so if I was going to be sitting with someone and giving them advice at this time, I would encourage them to remember that cash is always king. Keep your connections open, talk to as many people as you can, network as much as you can to find out where your potential opportunities and support are. All right, thanks. That was a tough question. Jason, did you have a question? Well, I was just gonna say, Christine, I, I agree with you with, you know, I could not agree with you more in that regard. So entrepreneurs have to understand their assets, both human and fixed. They have to maintain current assets that are primarily cash they have to understand consumer behaviors i mean change management is is understanding the because the only certainty is the uncertainty we don't know yeah yeah i couldn't agree with with you more thanks it's a crystal ball and I don't know if Jason or Christine or anything, but just in some environments I've been in where we've seen some, uh, in terms of employee retention, we've seen some really great applicant pools on some of our positions, much better than we had been seeing a year ago. But yet there's also other positions that I know I've been talking to folks that are not seeing good applicant pools for jobs, even in a higher unemployment world. Have, yeah. have you all seen any of that in terms of employee, I guess, pools that are available to businesses? I have to be honest to say that's not an element that comes into play in my current role or my activity. And that I think um, at this time, what I try to do for my clients um, in my current role is to keep my finger on the pulse of where their opportunities are. And we don't spend a lot of time talking about um, hiring at this point. Um, it's more about staff retention, good information, 
safety and health protocol. Where's the pivot? Um, so I don't have I don't have any details on that. I don't know about anybody else. We we did kind of talk about that in December a little bit where there where there are opportunities and the businesses that are in a financial position and in a market position to compete acquiring talent there is really good talent that's out there mm -hmm. and so it it really is incumbent on the business to do a good job of of marketing positions that it has available um being creative and diverse in how it promotes its 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 uh, job postings you you they're out there no no doubt about it because what is it um 800 businesses a day nationwide are closing and there's a lot of people looking to migrate to less population dense areas there's a lot of opportunity to attract talent attract assets attract market share i don't know if that answers your question joel but i, I the businesses i work with yes all right thanks um, any other questions from anyone Any final comments you wanted to make, Christine? Mm, boy, I didn't think about that. No, I mean, sure, a bazillion. <laughs> Be good to yourself, hmm? get rest, you know, fill your own well first so that you can help other people. All right, well, appreciate those comments and I appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise and some of those experiences. And now I feel like I need a cupcake. Um, if only I could I get to... virtually hand out cupcakes. I would That's have right. to say that the cupcakes are excellent. They're my kids' favorite. So, oh. yeah, whenever we would go to the good food store, that's what they would want for a treat. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Now I really want a cupcake for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Christine, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. And if you haven't marked your calendar yet, February 4th at 11 o'clock will be next month. And that, again, will be using social media to reach your clientele. And specifically, we're going to talk a little bit about TikTok on that session as well. So um, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone, and we hope you will join us for our February webinar. Thanks, Joel.